Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This morning, I thought I'd take the opportunity to tell you three stories about some of my all-time maritime heroes. And the first story is about probably the most successful wartime uh, naval commander in history. And the second story is about the man who stole the Suez Canal and quite literally wrote the book on seamanship. And finally, um, a story about a shipwreck that broke every heart in a tiny English village. But we'll get into the, the first one first, obviously. So Lord Sir Thomas Cochrane of the Royal Navy, the 10th Earl of Dundonald, he was born in Scotland to a noble family in 1775, the first of seven sons, all of went, who went on to have remarkable careers in the military and also in diplomatic circles. He had always wanted to join the Royal Navy, but his father, who was the 9th Earl of Dundonald, insisted that he follow in his footsteps and join the British Army. So he was enrolled in military college uh, initially, but after the first year when the results came through of the exams, it was, it was decided that um, young Thomas wasn't suited to a military career. So he transferred over, got his wish, and transferred over to the Royal Navy at the age of 17 and became a midshipman. This was the outbreak of the French Revolutionary War, which was the, the time where King Louis XVI and his uh, wife Marie Antoinette and 16,594 French noblemen and women uh, lost their heads on the guillotine. He, um, young Thomas joined HMS Hind, which was commanded by his uncle, who was also Thomas Cochrane. And they had a very successful time. During a, a short period of time, they captured uh, eight uh, French ships, and they were able to recapture a British ship that had been captured earlier by the French. And at that time, young Thomas distinguished himself with his uh, bravery, but also his initiative during these battles. And in 1796, he was promoted to lieutenant. And then two years later, he was promoted to the eighth lieutenant aboard the great battleship HMS Balflower. Now, Balflower is a great ship of 98 guns, a huge ship. It had been the flagship of the British Navy through the American Revolutionary War, the French Revolutionary Wars, and later on during the Napoleonic Wars as well. But while he was serving as the 8th Lieutenant, young Thomas Cochrane was court-martialed on the orders of the 1st Lieutenant, a man by the name of Philip Beaver, uh, for insubordination. When the court-martial convened and went through the charges, Cochrane was eventually reprimanded uh, for the lesser charge of flippancy. But Beaver was also reprimanded for being a little bit too precious. But this was, wasn't to be the first time, this, this only, wasn't going to be the last time, I mean, that um, young Thomas Cochrane was going to have a run in with very petty authority. Um, in February 1800, he received his first command, which was a prize ship. Now, back in the day, in those days, when you captured a vessel, uh, you would put a prize crew on board, and that prize crew would sail that vessel to a friendly port. The, the value of the ship and its cargo would be assessed, and prize money for that ship would be distributed amongst the, the captain and the officers and the crew of the ship that had captured it. So young Thomas was given command of this prize ship and told to take it to a, a friendly English port, uh, along with eight crew. Now along the way, a huge storm broke out, and they had to get up into the rigging to furl in those sails, to take in the sails so that the, the, wind was, the, the ship was a lot more stable. But one of the seamen actually fell from the rigging and badly injured himself. And without a moment's hesitation, young Cochrane, who was commanding the ship at the time, raced up into the rigging himself and helped the other sailors hurl in, or furl in those, those sails. Now, the men aboard the ship had never seen this from a British officer before. They didn't know he could or even that he would be able to do this sort of thing. Um, and so the reputation went, his reputation went around the fleet as someone who wouldn't order men to do something that he wouldn't do himself. And then he was given command of HMS Speedy. And when he first arrived on the Speedy, he wasn't very impressed at all. It was a small 14-gun brig, had seven guns on each side, and these were only very small guns, uh, four-pounders. He wasn't impressed with the headroom below decks either. There was only five feet of headroom, so he had to duck everywhere he went. And he complained that he could carry a whole broadside of ammunition in his coat pocket, which amounted to seven four-pound um, uh, shots. But Speedy became a very lucky ship, 
and every commanding officer of the Speedy, including Cochrane, went on to have very distinguished military, uh, naval careers, and every single commander of the Speedy went on to become admirals in the Royal Navy. So a very lucky ship. Uh, during one of the battles uh, they participated in, a, a Spanish uh, frigate was attacking the, um, was, was closing in on the Speedy. Cochrane knew they were outgunned, so he ran up the Danish flag and they also rang up the yellow flag indicating that it was plague on board, so the Spanish left them alone. On another occasion, they were being chased by a French frigate, and so Cochrane doused all the lights on his ship because it was night time. He put a, a lantern on a barrel and set that adrift and changed course, and the French followed the, uh, the course of the barrel. And you may have seen the movie Master and Commander with Russell Crowe, where a very similar sort of thing happens. They build a raft and put uh, lights on that, and the, the French ship chases after that raft, and they're able to escape. And that story came directly from the Cochrane experience. But his greatest battle happened uh, on May the 6th, 1801. The Spanish, huge Spanish vessel, the El Gamo, was a bit like the, um, the, that uh, period's equivalent of the Bismarck. It was a huge ship that was going to cause a lot of damage to British shipping in the, uh, in the region. It had 32 massive guns and a crew of 319 men compared to the Speedy's 14 much smaller guns and only a crew of 54. But Cochrane knew that this ship was going to cause a lot of damage. He had to do something. So he hauled up the American flag, which was a neutral country at the time, and he closed in on the El Gamo. He came in so close um, before he, ran, he spiked the American flag, ran up the, um, the Union Jack and opened fire on the El Gamo. Um, he was so close, in fact, that the Spanish couldn't traverse their weapons, their, their guns, low enough, at an angle low enough to be able to hit the Speedy because it was such a small ship. But one cannonball did actually take Cochrane's hat off uh, during the battle. Every time the Spanish would try and muster to try and board the Speedy because it was so close, um, Cochrane would move away. And when the Spanish ran back to their guns, he would bring the Speedy back in close again and keep firing. He wasn't firing any four-pound um, uh, cannonballs at the ship because that would do nothing at all. Uh, so he was firing shot, trying to kill or maim as many of the Spanish crew as he possibly could. And over a period of hours, he wore down the Spanish till the point where he and his men were able to board the El Gamo. And despite the fact that uh, originally there'd been a, a five-to-one uh, odds against them, they were able to capture the El Gamo virtually intact. And over the next 13 months, he captured, sunk, or damaged 53 ships. Now, that's a rate of a ship per week, basically. And during this time, he became an absolute hero in England. The, the weekly papers printed stories about his adventures, and they, people, it was like a serial where people wanted to find out more and more what was happening. What did Cochrane do this week, for example? And one of the ways that he, he damaged and um, captured these ships he invented a new concept, and that was that he and his men would row into French harbours where French ships were anchored. Uh, he would climb aboard these ships, he'd to subdue the guards on duty, lock the crew below, and then he would cut the anchor rope and sail out, sail to a friendly port. After a while, he captured so many of these ships that way that after a while the French cottoned on to what was happening. So whenever the, it was an outgoing tide, the French always doubled their guard. So Cochrane changed his tactics again. He would row in with an ingoing tide now, and uh, he would climb aboard the ships, once again subdue the guards, try and set the ships alight, or sometimes he would just simply cut the anchor ropes and let the, the tide take the ships in and run them aground uh, on the rocks in, in the harbour. So he was very, very successful. Um, in uh, July 1801, he was actually captured by the French. And he was, his reputation was such at this time that the French admiral in charge invited him to dinner on uh, three nights, three consecutive nights, because he wanted to hear all these great stories that Cochrane had about his adventures. On the fourth day, Cochrane was exchanged as part of a prisoner exchange for a French captain. When Napoleon found out that his nemesis, the man that he called the Sea Wolf, had been exchanged for a mere French captain, he was furious. He sacked the admiral in charge and threatened to have him hung. And then in 1802, the Peace of Armines was signed and um, a war, the 
the, uh, the two countries were at peace and Cochrane decided to take himself to university. But it wasn't long before war broke out again. And in 1804, he was given command of HMS Palace, which had 32 guns, so it was a, a bigger ship than the Speedy. It captured and five and destroyed five French ships during his period on there. And then in 1806, he was given command of HMS Imperius, a larger ship again with 38 guns. On one of these, um, he, he developed a new strategy as well. He would raid ashore now. He would take his marines on board uh, these ships and he would raid uh, ashore. And on one case, he attacked the fortress of Monget. Now, this was a very strategic fort, and he approached the fort during the night once it came, overcame the sentries on duty, locked the garrison below, and he was able to capture the fort. The, uh, the fortress of Monget was on a strategic crossroads, and um, Napoleon's army was marching towards the British army, and Cochrane was able to hold them up for more than a month while the British was able, were able to uh, resupply uh, reinforce themselves and get ready for, for Napoleon. He also liked to go ashore and capture semaphore stations. Now, the French had a system where they had these large semaphore stations, signalling stations, which used arms to, to pass messages along, to, along the coast, but also messages to ships at sea. And these were very effective. But Cochrane used to love to go ashore and... Um, uh, set fire to these uh, semaphore stations so it would disrupt the, the French communications. And on one of these occasions, he actually captured the French code books. He, uh, he copied down the codes and then left the remains of the code book in the, um, in the ruins of uh, the burnt out ruins of the semaphore station. So the French didn't know that the codes had been compromised. So for several months, the British were able to read the French uh, signal traffic as it passed up and down the coast, which was very handy for them. He also uh, raided Fort Trinidad, and once again, this was a strategic fort. Uh, he, and once again, he was able to hold up the French army for two weeks, a much, much superior French army. But eventually, the French were overcoming the, overwhelming the defenders of the fort. Uh, Cochrane was the last to leave, and as he left, he uh, lit some gunpowder and blew up most of the fort. Now, one of um, Lord Louis Mountbatten uh, was very impressed. He was uh, Cochrane was one of uh, Mountbatten's heroes, and during World War II, he was head of special operations. He went to Churchill with an idea based on Cochrane's experiences, where he wanted to create a force that would raid uh, upon the enemy coast, and the Royal Marine Commandos were formed at that time, based on Cochrane. Then came the Battle of Basque Roads. Now, at the time, the French fleet were blockaded in the port of Rochford in the Bay of Biscay. And uh, the English fleet, the, the Channel fleet, were off the, uh, off the, uh, the port uh, blockading them in. But the English were under the command of a man by the name of Admiral James uh, Gambier, who his men nicknamed Dismal Jimmy, because he wasn't a very positive person at all. He's a very cautious person. He wasn't well liked by his men. And... Gambia refused to attack the French. He thought it was too dangerous to go into the port and to attack them, which frustrated a lot of his own senior officers, but also frustrated the Admiralty as well. Now, by this time, Cochrane had been elected as a Member of Parliament for his district in Scotland, and he was at, at a restaurant in London one evening, enjoying a meal, when the First Lord of the Admiralty walked past his table and stopped and said, OK, well, if you were in charge of, of this mission, what would you do? So Cochrane asked the waiter for some, some uh, ink and a pen, and using a cloth napkin, he outlined to the First Lord of the Admiralty exactly what he would do if he was in charge. Um, the First Lord didn't appoint him in charge of the fleet, but put him in charge of a mission to try and destroy the French fleet. And this was very embarrassing to a lot of senior officers in the British Navy, especially those officers who were in the Channel Fleet. Uh, they were embarrassed by the fact that their commanding officer had done nothing, and they were also frustrated with him. And Cochrane's plan was to use fire ships. When the tide and the wind were in his favour, he would send fire ships into the port, but he also built these things that they called bomb rafts. And these were huge rafts uh, packed with dozens of, of barrels of uh, gunpowder, and on top of those, that gunpowder, there was all these artil artillery shells placed on top. And these were set alight and uh, pushed into the, uh, the French harbour. 
and the French panicked. A lot of the ships, the French ships were destroyed. Uh, some of them, the French ships were able to cut their anchor ropes and make their way out of the harbour, but they were easy prey for the British ships out in the, the channel and they were either captured or destroyed. But most of the vests of the ships um, cut their anchor ropes and they drifted ashore uh, with that tide and with that wind and they were grounded on the, um, on the rocks and damaged upon the rocks and on the beach in, uh, in Rochford. Now, this was a fantastic opportunity for the British. And once again, Cochrane signalled to uh, his commander, uh, uh, Gambia, now is the time. Come in, They're virtually de the French are virtually defensive. This is the opportunity to destroy the entire French fleet. But once again, Gambia vacillated. He still said it was too dangerous to, do, to go in uh, to attack the French. His officers, his most senior officers, were furious, including Captain Hardy, who was uh, the man that was Nelson's favourite captain, the captain of the victory during the Battle of Trafalgar, and the man that um, cradled Nelson in his arms just before he died. He went to Gambia and said, this is embarrassing, it's frustrating, we need to go and attack, but Gambia refused. Uh, later on, Cochrane himself would go and confront Gambia, and he accused him of extraordinary hesitation, which is just one step down from outright cowardice. Now, um, afterward, this was still seen as a victory. A lot of the French fleet had been destroyed, so it was still a victory and the, and the Admiralty took credit for it. Um, people didn't know that it was a lost opportunity to destroy the entire French fleet. And as far as the British public were concerned, the Parliament and the press were all concerned, this was a wonderful victory. And praise was heaped upon Gambia for this victory. It was decided in Parliament that they would read out a letter of congratulations in Parliament, uh, congratulating Gambia, and also award him a, a financial prize for doing so. Now, Cochrane had not said anything publicly. He had not uh, uh, criticised uh, Gambia at all publicly. But when this came about, he said that he was going to use his position within Parliament to block that letter of congratulations and finally tell the truth about what had really happened. But um, when Gambia heard about this, he requested that he be court-martialed. He himself be court-martialed and tried by his peers. Now, the Admiralty didn't want the controversy. They couldn't afford the controversy. They had told everyone that it was a great victory. They hadn't said anything about the opportunity lost. And so the court-martial was stacked with supporters of, of Gambia. Any officer, including Captain Hardy and others, uh, who were prepared to testify against Gambia, were transferred to places like Gibraltar and Malta, and even as far as Australia. And so uh, Gambia was actually cleared from, uh, during that court-martial, and uh, he was awarded his cash prize, although the letter was never read publicly in Parliament. And then came the great stock, market, stock exchange fraud of 1814. On February the 21st, 1814, a rumour suddenly spread around London that there'd been a great victory and that Napoleon was dead. And in consequence, the London stock market soared, including a government security stock by the name of Omnium. Now, later on, it was found out that this was a deliberate fraud. Someone had deliberately defrauded the stock market. In the meantime, Cochrane, his uncle and his financial advisor had sold their shares in Omnium and had made a 1.1 million pound profit, which is good money in today's terms, but it was you know, a huge amount of money back in those days. And so fingers started pointing at Cochrane. He denied all knowledge of it, and even though there was not much evidence to go by, he was arrested and put on trial. He was eventually convicted of the crime, even though, as I said, there was, wasn't much evidence, and what evidence there was was very circumstantial. The 1.1 million profit that they made was confiscated. He was fined a thousand pounds. He was sentenced to 12 months in prison, which was later uh, commuted. Um, he was discharged dishonorably from the Royal Navy, and uh, he had his knighthood uh, revoked, uh, taken away from him. He uh, was expelled as a member of parliament. He was a broken man, basically. He was also sent, his uh, uh, family banner was removed from Westminster Abbey as a punishment, and he was sentenced to an hour of public pillory, or in time in the stocks, which was later commuted as well. 
Now, this is a, a newspaper caricature of the time which shows on one side the great British naval hero that everyone admired and, and, uh, and loved, and on the other side, uh, the crooked politician who uh, had his uh, award, his knighthood stripped from him, his epaulets uh, taken from his uniform, his sword broken, indicating a dishonourable discharge and the, the charges of, um, of uh, fraud being made against him. Now, the public were in his favour. Like I said, he denied all knowledge of it. The public believed him. Um, when they did a by-election in his electorate to elect a new member of parliament, his name was put forward, even though he didn't uh, ask for it to be done. He didn't do any um, uh, canvassing or uh, trying, to, trying to be elected at all, but uh, he was elected with an increased majority by the local people, and which was a very embarrassing for the government, and the person who came second in that election eventually uh, got to sit in parliament because Cochrane still wasn't allowed to. Later on, uh, during the, uh, the 19th century, there was three inquiries by the Lord Chancellor, different Lord Chancellors, uh, the highest office in, in uh, the UK, and each one of those three inquiries found that uh, Cochrane had no case to answer for, he shouldn't have been found guilty, it was mainly for political reasons that he did. In 1832, he received a, pull, a full pardon from Queen Victoria, and he was reinstated into the Royal Navy, and in 1860, his banner was restored to uh, Westminster Abbey the day before he was buried there. And in 1876, his grandson received compensation of three and a half million pounds uh, for the money that they lost out on, that 1.1 million, plus the damage that it did to the family's reputation, which is, you know, good money if you can get it. But he left England in absolute disgrace, and he took up the position as commander of the Chilean Navy in their war of independence against the Spanish. Now, the Chilean Navy wasn't much of a navy, it was three ships, but he took command, he retrained all the men in that navy along British uh, guidelines, um, using British systems, and they were quite successful in raiding Spanish shipping along that Chilean coast. But then came the capture of Valdiva, and he went back to his old ways. Now, Valdiva was the... the um, the most fortified city in South America at the time, a Spanish stronghold. It was a city that was guarded by seven forts that surrounded the city. But Cochrane, uh, using his old methods, took 300 men uh, with him from two ships. They clambered up the cliffs of Valdiva, capturing the first fort. And they subdued the sentry and locked the garrison below. And then these forts were all connected. So he went around and during the night they captured all seven forts. And next morning, when the governor of Valdiva woke up, not only was his garrison captured, but all the guns of the forts were turned inwards towards him. So he had no choice but to surrender. And um, the Spanish granted Chile their independence. And if you go to um, uh, Santiago or Valparaiso, you'll see statues of Cochrane uh, all over the place. He's their greatest maritime hero. And then he was given command of the Peruvian Navy, who were also fighting their war in independence against the Spanish as well. And once again, he had some success. Now, the greatest success he had was when, in 1820, um, he attacked the Esmeralda. The Esmeralda was the most um, powerful Spanish ship in South America at the time. It had 44 massive guns. And it was anchored in uh, Calio Bay, under the protection of the guns from the fort at Calio as well. But once again, using his old methods, he and his men rowed in, they clambered up the side of the ship, they overpowered the sentry, locked the crew below, cut the anchor rope and sailed the ship out. So now they had the most powerful ship in South America. And once again, the Spanish had had enough, uh, they surrendered and they granted Chile their independence. Oh, sorry, Peru, Peru, their independence. And then he took command of the Brazilian Navy in their war of independence against the Portuguese. Uh, he took command on the 21st of March, 1823, uh, sorry, 21, but at this time now, his reputation was such that he didn't have to fight anymore. He sailed into the city of Mariano and spoke to the commander there and said, if you don't surrender, my fleet's going to arrive tomorrow and we're going to level the city. Uh, end of story, you've got two choices. So the, um, the governor of Mariano surrendered without firing a shot. When the nearby city of um, 
Bellum de Parra found out what had happened, they also surrendered without firing a shot. They didn't know that there was no fleet. This was all that, um, that Cochrane had. It was all a complete bluff. So Cochrane was made the Marquis of Mariano in, um, in gratitude. And then he also became the commander of the Greek Navy in their war of independence against the Ottoman Empire. But that didn't last very long because a joint fleet from Britain and France went to the aid of the Greeks as well. So um, uh, Cochrane decided to return to England in uh, 1832. He, uh, his father had died the year before and he became the 10th Earl of Dundonald on uh, July 1st, 1831. He'd um, been pardoned by the Queen. Those, those uh, chancellors had found that he had no case to answer to. So he was reinstated into the Royal Navy with the, um, the rank of Rear Admiral of the Blue. But over the years, he received eight more promotions until he became Admiral of the Red. His knighthood was restored. His uh, banner was restored to Westminster Abbey the day before he died on October 31st, 1860. Now, there's, over the years, there's been five warships named the Cochrane um, as part of the Chilean Navy. And on um, Chilean Independence Day each year, there's a <coughs> sorry, special ceremony in Westminster Abbey, which is attended by uh, the, uh, usually by high dignitaries from Chile, and also members of the royal, British royal family, to honour uh, their hero. Now, Napoleon called in the Sea Wolf. Uh, Horatio Hornblower, the novel by C.S. Forrester, is based on Cochrane. Uh, also, Jack Aubrey in the Patrick O'Brien novels of Master and Commander and the films, they're all based on Cochrane. So, a wonderful career. But he's better known in uh, Chile than he is in his own country, which is a bit sad. And now the story of the man who stole the Suez Canal. Now, the Suez Canal, you know, I was really looking forward to going through the Suez Canal on this trip to <laughs> Emu... But alas, it's not to be, because I wanted to follow one of my heroes, which turned out to be the very first person to sail through the canal. Now, the canal was open on November 12th, uh, sorry, 17th, 1869. It's 101 miles from the Mediterranean through to the Red Sea. It was opened by um, the ruler of Egypt at the time, Ishmael the Magnificent, and he invited dignitaries from all over the world to see the opening of this magnificent structure, including uh, Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria, who later became famous himself, um, Princess Eugenie from France, um, the Prince of Wales, who later became uh, Edward VII, and the Prince of the Netherlands, plus a lot of other dignitaries who came along to see this incredible opening. Now, the honour, because the French had been so involved in this. They had come up with the concept for the, the Suez Canal. They had done a lot of the, the, um, the design work on the canal and also the construction work on the canal. So because of that, the French were going to be given the honour of the first to sail through the Suez Canal with the royal yacht, the La Agile, or the Eagle. But that was until George Nares came along, aboard HMS Newport. Now, initially the British had opposed the construction of the Suez Canal, uh, and then it wasn't until much later that they bought a 50% stake in the canal. And the night before the, uh, the official opening of the canal, using some magnificent seamanship ability, which he became famous for, with no lights whatsoever, he manoeuvred his way through this armada of ships anchored uh, outside, waiting to go through the next day, until when dawn broke, they found, everyone found that the Newport and George Nares in command was at the front of the line and no one could get past him. So while officially the very first vessel to sail through the, um, the Suez Canal is the La Gille, unofficially the real person who sailed through first was George Nares aboard the Newport. Um, and we'll come to that a little bit later. He had joined the, um, the Royal Navy at the age of 14 and was a midshipman for some time on the Australian station, doing a lot of survey work along that Queensland coast where the Great Barrier Reef is, and got a, got a lot of experience there. And then he was made second mate on the magnificent British battleship HMS Resolute, who for two years went searching for the Lost Franklin Expedition in the Arctic, and I'll be talking about the Franklin Expedition at a later time, so keep that in mind. So he, during that time, he gained a lot of Arctic experience. He served with distinction during the Crimean War, 
But um, he be, because of his commanding officers realized that he had a magnificent ability with, with um, uh, seamanship ability, but he also had the ability to pass that knowledge on to other people, younger cadets. So he was put in command of HMS Britannia, which was the Naval Cadet Training Center. And while he was there, he produced the Nares Guide to Seamanship, which uh, every cadet, every naval cadet in Britain was issued at the time. They were also issued to every Commonwealth Navy. The Nares Guide to Seamanship was issued to the American Navy. It was translated into eight languages. It was always used in the Scandinavian navies, the Russian Navy, and also the German Navy for some time as well. And when I was in the Navy, I used to have a, a first edition copy of it. I don't know what happened to it, unfortunately. Um, but it is the, literally the guide to seamanship, a magnificent book. And a couple of years ago, Lee and I were cruising around on our boat, and we went to the city of Harlingen in uh, the Netherlands to see the final of the, the final race of the tall ships. Uh, actually, it's on again in Amsterdam in August, so we're going to be sailing down there to look at it again. And this is 50 of the most beautiful tall ships in the world who sail into the harbour with all their sails up. Um, they're all crewed by youth from all over the world who uh, pay to go onto these vessels. And it's funny, when you, you see videos of these kids, um, when they, get, they first get on board, they're all nervous and shy. You see them going up into the rigging for the first time, and uh, it's very tentative, very, very scared about doing it. Some people won't even do it. But a month later, you see these same kids scurrying up into the rigging and hurling in these, burling in these sails, um, just standing on a, on a bit of rope you know, shackled to, the, um, to another piece of rope. And uh, they're singing sh sea shanties. They've made friends from all over the world. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. But when these kids uh, sign on, they're sent a, a, an equipment list, what they need to bring on the ship with them, and um, you know, clothes and things like that, but also a, a list of what they should read before they come along. And the very first thing on that list is the Nares Guide to Seamanship. And every one of these ships that we saw uh, has that guide on board as well. He was um, surveying the, the Gulf of um, Suez when the, uh, the canal was due to open. And as I said before, he was the very first person to traverse through the entire length of the Suez Canal. The Ishmael the Magnificent, the ruler of Egypt, and the French protested strongly to the British that this, this was just not good enough. You shouldn't have done this. And publicly, Nares was reprimanded. Privately, he was promoted and given a medal for his efforts, and uh, justly so. And then he was given command of HMS Challenger during the Challenger expedition. Now, this is a half-hour talk in itself. This was one of the greatest scientific voyages of all time. We knew a lot at this time around the, the seas around the coastlines of various countries, but we knew nothing about what was in the deepest parts of the ocean. So the Challenger voyage was to find out more about the, what was there and, uh, and how deep things were. And the reason they pointed Nares was because of his great seamanship ability, but also because of his scientific knowledge. Um, he was, they had uh, 243 men aboard this 225-foot boat, so ship. So it was very, very cramped, mostly with scientists. Now, there was a lot of egos on board, and it was thought the only man that could uh, look after and massage, massage these eagles, egos was George Nares, because of his seamanship ability, because of his scientific knowledge, and also because of his surveying knowledge that he'd, he'd gained. Now, this is a 68,000 nautical mile voyage. I think we're going a long way. Um, and as I said, it's because of his expertise that he was given command. And this was the, the first time that laid the foundations for all hydrographic and oceanographic uh, work. They took soundings throughout the deepest parts of the ocean using 181 miles of Italian hemp rope. And the Challenger became the very first ship, propelled ship, to um, uh, traverse through the Antarctic Ocean. The Nares Deep, which is in the Puerto Rico Trench, the deepest part of the Atlantic Ocean, is named for George Nares, uh, and the, um, the Challenger Deep, which is the, in the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of any ocean in the world, it's up near Guam, is named for the Challenger. And also the Space Shuttle Challenger uh, was named in honour of HMS Challenger, and it's a voyage of exploration. 
Um, once he'd finished that mission, the Admiral decided to give him a much more arduous mission. And this was to go to take two vessels to the other end of the world, to the Arctic. And he took the ship's discovery and alert up as close to the North Pole as he could possibly get. He was the very first person to sail between uh, Greenland and Ellesmere Island, which is now called the Nares Strait, in his honour. And he led a sledging party, which was set a new record for furthest north or closest to the North Pole than anyone had ever got before. He returned to England, he was knighted, uh, he eventually retired as a Vice Admiral. Uh, he died in um, January 5th, uh, 1915 at the age of 83. And he's always been a hero of mine um, because of his uh, work on the Challenger and also because of that Nares Guide to Seamanship uh, and some of the things, he, his two voyages to the Arctic. But um, he's best known around the world as the man who stole the Suez Canal. Okay. Now, I've got to warn you on this one. Um, I've done this a couple of times before, just a couple of times, and I little, get a little bit emotional through this talk. I'm just going to see if I can make it through today. Um, I'm not really sure why it is. Um, my mum used to be uh, a member of the Australian Volunteer Lifeguard for several years before she passed away. <coughs> so I'm not sure whether it's that or... Um, Sorry. or um, just the nature of the story itself, but um, we'll see how we go. And the story starts, I mean, we, we first learnt about this story, Lee and I, a couple of years ago, we were in England, and we decided to go to Land's End, um, for no particular reason, apart from the fact that we thought that this would, be, would have been the last place in, in the UK that our forebears would have seen when, before they emigrated to Australia. So I thought that's you know, a good reason to go. And while we were planning the trip, we saw on the map a little village called Mousehole. M-O-U-S-E-H-O-L-E. -E, Mousehole. <laughs> oh, I know. If you ask for directions to Mousehole, you won't get there because it's called Mousel. <laughs> Go figure. So we, we stopped there for lunch. We went to the, the pub there, the ship inn, and um, this is when we first heard about this, this great story. And it all starts in Denmark, where the ship, the Union Star, was built. It was going to be, take, be on its maiden voyage, uh, which is going to pick up fertiliser in the Netherlands and take that to Ireland, because that's just what they need in Ireland, isn't it? More um, fertiliser. <laughs> Didn't say it. It's a, it was a 70-metre uh, ship by 11 metres. It was just a coastal freighter. These thousands of these things all around the world, you know, they're the workhorse of the ocean. Uh, only had one engine, and it had a crew of five men under the command of Captain Henry Morton. Now, during the voyage, Morton stopped off the coast of England. It was an unscheduled and unauthorised stop to pick up his wife and two teenage daughters so that they could spend Christmas with each other. So on board, there was a total of eight souls on board. Now, the whole idea was that they were going to come through the channel here and around Land's End up to Ireland. And there's Mousel. <laughs> Told you how to spell it. Um, and uh, when they got off the coast up here, something happened. And on the 19th of December, 1981, at 1800, the Union Star reported to the Coast Guard at Falmouth that they were having engine problems. Now, this wasn't unusual for the Coast Guard. This is the sort of thing that happened all the time. But they took note of it. They were having engine trouble and they were eight miles off the coast. They didn't, Morton didn't send a mayday at all, but he spoke to the Coast Guard on Channel 16, which is international distress frequency, uh, which is monitored by all ships as part of safety of life at sea. And at 1816, the, the um, tug, the s tug, the Nord Holland, radioed the Union Star, offering assistance under the Lloyd's open letter of salvage. Now, this is a normal procedure. The Lloyd's open letter of salvage is, is a quite normal sort of thing. Instead of offering a tow at a set rate to a nearest port, with the Lloyd's open letter of salvage, um, the price of that, um, of that tow is, goes to a, a committee or a board, and it's based on things like the value of the ship, the value of the cargo, the number of people on board, the imminent danger to the ship, all those types of things. And once they, they look at that, they value um, the cost of the salvage. So it's usually a lot more than just a tow. 
And in this case, based on the, the age of the ship, which was brand new, it could have run into the tens or even the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Morton didn't want to make that decision himself. So he contacted his head office to ask for advice about what to do. He also knew that if there was an open letter of salvage inquiry, it would come to light that he had his wife and daughters on board which hadn't been authorised to do so. So maybe that had something to do with his, his, um, his decision as well. Now, this is the Nord Holland. Um, eventually, he did get permission from head office to accept the tow. But by that time, it was too late. The Nord Holland had moved on to another job and couldn't get back in time to, to help the Union Star. Now, by this time, the, the weather was a force five. It was pretty bad, but not too bad at all. Um, pretty normal sort of conditions. But the barometer was dropping, and the forecast was for some dreadful weather to come later that night. Now, in the meantime, the Coast Guard contacted the uh, coxswain of the, um, the Penley lifeboat. Um, and the, he and the crew were putting up the Christmas lights in, in Mausel at the time. And he alerted, the, the Coast Guard alerted them to be on standby. Now, by this time, the weather had really turned bad. And if you talk to old timers along that coast, they will tell you that this was the worst storm they had ever seen up until that time and they've ever seen since that time. It got up to force 12, which is the highest level on the Beaufort scale. The hurricane conditions, terrible conditions with 64 to 18 meter waves crashing uh, along that coastline there. No one's had ever seen anything that bad before. At uh, 1941 or 741, Captain Morton reported to the Coast Guard that they'd found water in the fuel tank. So there was no way that they were going to be able to get that engine restarted and they requested assistance. So the Coast Guard contacted the Royal Navy and they launched Helicopter Rescue 80 under the command of Lieutenant Commander Russell Smith of the United States Navy, who was on exchange uh, with the Royal Navy at the time. Now, this helicopter later became famous the following year because it was a helicopter that Prince Andrew uh, flew during the Falklands War. Um, it's funny, though. I mean, a, a little while ago, I saw an interview with Prince Andrew, and um, he uh, said he had no recollection of ever touching this helicopter, let alone going for a, a, a ride in it. <laughs> but I might be getting that mistake mixed up with another interview. <laughs> And the helicopter is now on display at the Fleet Air Arm Museum. So when the Smith and the helicopter Rescue 80 reached there, they reported that they were only, the Union Star was now only two and a half miles off the coast. The waves were, the ferocious waves were pushing them towards the coast. Um, they tried to winch a man down. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a helicopter, but they're not the most stable things at the best of times. But in Force 12 hurricane conditions, they're awful to be in. I, I wouldn't want to be in one at all. Smith had to turn the helicopter into the wind and try and winch a man down. Now, we spoke to Russ Smith, and um, he said on several occasions he had to yank the, the yoke back uh, so hard that it cracked the, um, the console on the helicopter. Because you can imagine, they've got the lights of the ship. All the floodlights on the ship were on. There was the spotlights coming down from the helicopter. But outside of that, it was pitch dark, and he couldn't possibly, Russell Smith couldn't possibly see these waves as they came uh, close to the ship and the swell that lifted the ship up 60 feet suddenly. So he had to pull the yoke up several times, just narrowly avoiding hitting the, uh, the rotors, hitting the superstructure of the ship. So eventually, they winched a man, they tried to get a man down. The winchman later said that he got so close that he could see a woman on the deck. All he could describe about her was she was wearing pink shoes, but they couldn't get any closer. And uh, Smith had to inform the Coast Guard that it was far too dangerous to try and get a man down there. And so, as a last resort, they called the... <sighs> Sorry. The um, Penley lifeboat. Now, this was under the command of um, Trellon Richards, who was a coxswain of the, of the lifeboat. And he had 12 volunteers, but he told them that he'd only take eight men out that night, and two of those men who volunteered were Nigel and Neil Brockman. Um, Neil Brockman was only 17 years old at the time, but he was an experienced lifeboat man. But uh, 
Riches told them that he would not send two men from the same family out that night. So the lifeboat was launched at 20 past, uh, sorry, 12 minutes past eight. Now to launch that lifeboat, you have to slide down that, um, that ramp uh, out into the sea. That was the way that you launch a lifeboat. And the lifeboat launching crew said that they had to wait several agonizing minutes because there was no break in these huge waves before they could launch the boat. Now the Solomon Brown, <laughs> don't you start, uh, <laughs> is only a 14 meter or 47 foot wooden boat. It has a top speed of nine knots. Um, it reached the Union Star at um, uh, 8.46 that evening. And by this time, Smith was reporting that the, um, the ship was only one mile from the coast. Captain um, Morton had lowered the anchors. He dropped his anchors, but these were, were dragging along. They weren't uh, protecting um, the ship at all. Uh, they weren't stopping the ship at all. And because the ship was getting close, so close to shore, it was getting shallower. So these waves were now breaking over the, the top of the ship during this, this incredible storm. Smith reported finally that they were 300 yards from the coast and time was running out quickly. Um, he said that he, from his observation in the helicopter, he looked on as time and time again the Solomon Brown would come up against the side of the Union Star and, and get uh, bashed and battered against the side. He said that the crewmen on the Solomon Brown desperately tried to grab hold of the rails and hold the rails, but they were forced back by the force of the, um, of the, the waves. The, um, the Solomon Brown at one stage was picked up and deposited right on the forecastle of the, of the Union Star. But when the, the seas rolled again, it slipped back into the, to the water again. Smith reported that they were now only 10 minutes from the beach. And uh, then he re later reported um, that he was facing into the wind and that his tail raters was, were almost touching the cliff face behind him. They were so close to the shore. But the Solomon Brown, he, he also reported that people ran out of the wheelhouse of the Union Star and jumped into the water down to the Solomon Brown. Um, then the Solomon Brown reported, there's a radio report, and if you listen to this, it's a very, very excited radio report saying, we've got four off, we've got four off. And it goes on to say, there's still two on board. Now, that was confusing because everyone knew that there was eight people on board by this stage. Um, so they got four off. They were on the lifeboat, there's still two on the ship, where were the other two? So if you listen to the radio broadcast uh, from Coast Guard at Falmouth, they're confused, and you can hear that confusion in the voice as they radio back the, Union, the Solomon Brown for confirmation, but they never received a response. Um, <coughs> when dawn broke the next morning, they found the skeletons of both these, these vessels washed up on the rocks. All 16 people, the eight people aboard the Union Star and the eight people aboard the Solomon Brown were lost. Over the next two days, they recovered eight bodies in total, four from the Union Star, four from the Solomon Brown. And on Christmas Eve, um, two members of the lifeboat crew, two heroes, uh, were buried in Mausel, and on Boxing Day, the other two were buried as well. Um, Smith later said it was the greatest act of courage he had ever seen or is ever likely to see. And this was at the inquiry that, uh, into the disaster. But some good did come out of it. Um, during that inquiry into the disaster, recommendations were, recommendations were made. And now the Coast Guard in England is no longer passive. And the Coast Guard can order that, um, and can issue a mayday on behalf of a ship or order the captain to issue a mayday. And they can also order the captain to take a tow or abandon ship if necessary. Um, Neil Brockman, who wasn't allowed to go out that night, um, uh, 10 years later, he became the coxswain of the Penley lifeboat, and he served in that capacity for 15 years. If you ever go to Penley, and I recommend you, uh, sorry, Mausel, and I recommend you do, um, there's we've got some great memorials to these, these heroes, um, just a wonderful town. And on um, the 19th of December each year, um, between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock, the Christmas lights are turned off in honour of the heroes. <sighs> so ladies and gentlemen, always support the RNOI. Um, that's the story of the Penley lifeboat disaster. It's the story of um, some of my heroes. 
hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you again in a couple of days' time. Thank you.